This is the Before You Read lecture on 2 Corinthians. Of the writings in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians is perhaps one of the most complex and complicated writings. As will be clear in the course of this lecture, many scholars suspect that 2 Corinthians is a composite document, meaning that it is made up of several originally distinct letters or letter fragments. In addition, it is difficult to trace Paul's interactions with the Corinthians after he wrote 1 Corinthians. And finally, Paul's defensive nature can make it difficult to follow parts of the letter. To begin with a brief orientation to the letter, it may be helpful to begin with a recap of Paul's relationship to the Corinthians. So here is a brief outline of Paul's interactions with the Corinthians, including his mention of letters that are now lost. So, we know that first Paul visits and founds the church in Corinth. We see this in Acts 18 and mention of this in 2 Corinthians 1.19. Paul then writes his first letter, which is now lost, about sexual immorality. And we hear this mentioned on, in 1 Corinthians 5.9. Paul then receives an oral report and a letter from the Corinthians, which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1.11 and 7.1. Paul then writes his second letter to the Corinthians, which is what we now know as 1 Corinthians. Paul then has an unplanned visit and a painful confrontation with the Corinthians that we hear about in several places in 2 Corinthians. Paul then writes a third, now last, letter that is referred to as uh, perhaps the letter of tears. Um, and maybe this is uh, mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2, 3 through 4, and again in 7, 12. At some point, Paul receives a good report from Titus about the Corinthians' response to his letter and uh, that their response even went too far. So we can see that in 2 Corinthians 7. In Paul's absence, uh, the so-called super-apostles enter Corinth and are critical of Paul's ministry. Their basic charge, according to Fredrickson in the, uh, in the Fortress Commentary of the Bible, is that Paul's physical presence is not appropriate for that of an apostle, although his written correspondence is, um, is. So there's a disparity between Paul's words and deeds, in other words. And so then Paul writes a fourth letter, which is what we now know of as 2 Corinthians. You're beginning to see how complex this relationship is. Second, let's talk briefly about the literary themes in 2 Corinthians. As mentioned earlier in this lecture, many scholars doubt that 2 Corinthians, at least as we have it, is a single letter. As David Fridrickson notes in the Fortress Commentary of the Bible, New Testament, 2 Corinthians has, quote, impressed itself on scholars as a collection of originally separate Pauline writings, a quilt made up of several letter fragments. The text as we read it today appears to have seems to have been sewn together at a time unknown by an editor unnamed. And so here is a slide that illustrates briefly the possible themes in 2 Corinthians. Finally, by way of orientation, uh, briefly mentioning the lost letters. Um, there is uh, the first letter to the Corinthians, again, that was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. And then this so-called letter of tears, which is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2, 3 through 4. Uh, we have no record of either of these uh, letters, as far as we know. Here, then, is an outline of 2 Corinthians. You can see that Paul spends a good bit of time talking about himself or his relationship with the Corinthians. So as you read 2 Corinthians, a few things to be on the lookout for. First, be on the lookout for what scholars would say is Paul's apology. So much of 2 Corinthians contains Paul's emphatic and emotional defense of his apostleship, ministry, and character. As David Fredrickson points out, we only get Paul's side of the story, and it's clearly not unbiased. And so, Think about, were the opponents right? Is Paul a heavy-handed and egotistical self-promoter? Even if it is ironic or sarcastic, Paul does spend a lot of time boasting and talking about himself. And so the Corinthian letters are essentially an extended define the relationship between Paul and the Corinthians. What about 2 Corinthians then is of relevance to 21st century readers. So much of it seems historically and socially contextualized. What do we take away from it? Second, pay attention to what Paul says about strength and weaknesses. 
In several places, 2 Corinthians plays with the categories of strength and weakness. Paul seems to divine strength not on the basis of worldly systems of measurement. It is not a matter of fine speech or impressive speech or uh, physical power, but about God's revelation in and through weakness. So as you read, I encourage you to think about this theology of weakness and how it might inform your own understanding of ministry and church. How has the church adopted a theology of strength that values what can be measured and seen rather than adopting a theology of weakness like that of 2 Corinthians? Finally, briefly, 2 Corinthians, the canon, and the church. As you read, think about what does all of this complexity mean for the New Testament and the church? I have a few suggestions, but you may have others. It at least emphasizes just how little we know about the process of writing and the reception of early Christian letters. It hints at the broader questions related to text criticism and divergent textual traditions that may be present in 2 Corinthians itself. It shows us that Paul's letters can be misunderstood and that they were, even perhaps by their first readers. It confirms that problems within the church and debates about authority are not new. And finally, it underscores the human character of sacred scripture. 2 Corinthians especially provides a clear picture of Paul's concern mixed with his ego, his distinct understanding of the gospel, and his desire to be right. As interpreters of scripture, we must wrestle with all of these aspects of 2 Corinthians. That is all that I have for our For You Read lecture on 2 Corinthians. Thank you for your time and attention.